instead of giving yourself this really high bar of I have to find passion with a capital P, I think you find interests, lowercase i. And interest means you scratch these itches. It may be podcasting, it may be social media, it may be graphics, it may be surfing, it may be you know, photography, who knows? But at the time you start these things, don't, don't say, uh, is this a passion? It's just an itch and you just scratch a lot of itches and some of them will turn out into passions, but you, you won't know that up front. And don't, don't, don't get into a fixed mindset that you need to find your passion young and dedicate yourself to that. You need to do sampling, a lot of sampling. Mr. Guy Kawasaki back on the show after, I don't know, a 10 year hiatus. Nice to see your face again. Good friend. How are you? I'm good. I mean, a lot has happened, like <laughs> near pandemic, <laughs> insurrection. <laughs> the list is long, uh, and you've been up to some really interesting stuff. For the handful of people who are perhaps not familiar with you or your work, I mean, I've got a lot of stories that go way back, uh, and I'll I will bring some of those up. But for the audience's sake, give us a little bit of background. Um, so, how how do you orient yourself, uh, and what would people what would be useful for people to know about your backstory to uh, get us started in today's show? I've been a very fortunate guy. So I was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, and. Thank you, God, a sixth grade teacher told my parents to get me out of the public school system, put me in a private school system so that I could go to college. And my parents listened to them and made that sacrifice. So I, I went into this prep school and I got into college. In college, I met a guy that eventually hired me as the second software evangelist into Apple. And so I worked at Apple. I started some software companies. I came back to Apple as Apple's chief evangelist. I left to start more companies, um, writer, speaker, podcaster. Today, I really define myself as a podcaster and the Canva chief evangelist. Canva is an online graphics design service. And I, I love podcasting and writing and surfing. <laughs> Those are some really good things in life to love. Uh, you've got yeah. a good, you've got a pretty good. Um, yeah, just as a, a little extra color, uh, we've known one another for more than a decade. I'll call it fifteen years, and I have to uh, give you uh, ex express a debt of gratitude to you to you really early introducing or early in introducing me to some of the Silicon Valley legends. I had a startup idea, you know gosh, in 2009. And I shared that idea with you and you thought it was just good enough to intro <laughs> introduce me to the next person. Uh, and that, you know, that startup w went on to, to help have tens of millions of customers and, and help a lot of people change their, their wow. lives. And, and I owe a debt of gratitude to you for those early introductions. So I want to take a second and say, thank you. And, uh, against the backdrop of the background that you shared with us and the the color that you've you know that that one might gather from our relationship around technology what about your current situation you you get to spend a lot of time with people who have made incredible impacts on the world i'm wondering if you can start us out by uh, what are some of the the traits that you see that are consistent across people sure. who've had a lot of impact. And, you know, you've got this background, you got a new book, which we'll talk about. There is sort of a remarkability about these folks. And I'm wondering if you can point to some of these attributes to get us sure. started. So my podcast is called Remarkable People. And over the last four years, I've interviewed roughly 200 people. I am. I mean, I can multiply four times 52. <laughs> And these people are truly remarkable. They're not necessarily rich or famous. They're remarkable. And I'll drop some names to help with recognition. But honestly, some of the most remarkable people you would have never heard of. So I have had Jane Goodall, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Steve Wozniak, Steve Wolfram, Angela Duckworth, Margaret Atwood, Stacey Abrams, uh, Vivek Murthy, you name it, I've had them. I, I think I have one of the best guest lists in all of podcasting. And so after a while, I figured out, you know, there's there's 200 hours of podcast. There's 4,000 pages of transcripts. 
that's a lot for anybody to go through. So that led to the idea to write this book with me filtering all that down to 170 pages. So that's <laughs> that's what I do now. And, um, you know, Mom, I think you can divide a career into three parts. So the first part is about growth and acquiring new skills. The second part is about grit, where you're just working your ass off. And the final step is grace. And in the grace period, which is where I am at, it's all about repaying and opening the door or keeping the door open for people who follow you. So it's not about you anymore. And so that's this is kind of my crowning touch that, you know, w when I die, I want people to say I help them make a difference. Well, that's one of the reasons uh, having advanced, you know, copy of the book here, we're recording this a month, a good month month and change before the book comes out um with that as sort of the the road that you just paved the ability to, to give back um i want to be clear that that's i feel like i received some of that grace from you maybe this was early on in your chapter of giving back uh now that you're you're you've matured as have i uh i think it's interesting that the book opens up with this the that story of the think different advertising campaign that apple ran back in the late 90s um you know, images of remarkable innovators who changed the world. And it seems like your ability to connect with these folks to, to, I guess, to galvanize some of their thinking and present it in a really useful way. Obviously, that is a valuable service, but you yourself are in that cadre of, of people who have thought different. I'm wondering what, you know, how, how how did that come about? What you know was it just about around being around greatness? Like, what are some of these fundamentals that have um, contributed to your ability to think different? Well, it, in in the famous words of Steve Jobs' commencement address, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. And so, I mean, it. it <laughs> If you, you already heard about this elementary school teacher, and I glossed over the Stanford experience. So, so I get to Stanford, and even before I got to Stanford, I fell in love with cars. I came from a lower middle income family, so I fell in love with cars. I didn't say I possessed any. <laughs> so I come to Stanford, and I meet this guy named Mike Boych, and he's from a very wealthy family from Arizona. And he's not only into cars, he possesses cars. So we had this really you know sort of totally mutual interests and in which he owned them and i loved them and so we became very good friends and he was very technical one of the smartest people i've ever met and he eventually wound up in the macintosh division and then he hired me into the macintosh division so you could say that guy's career is because of a love of cars <laughs> and because of nepotism so, okay <laughs> Um, you know, you could say it's all a fluke, but uh, it's my fluke. And and really, I mean, you know, it's not like it's not like I was in college and I said, oh, I got to hang around this guy who loves cars because someday he'll be inside Apple and he'll give me a job. <laughs> Nobody can think that far in advance. But this is the thing that most people don't understand is that the world works in mysterious ways. <laughs> and, and, and what I would argue is that it actually, the universe conspire around you if you're, if, if you're living in a really authentic way so that you're able to say that I'm, I was really passionate about cars and because of cars, I met this guy and because this guy was super technical, got into Apple. That's how I... You know, there, there's a phrase that is called imposter syndrome, and most of us walk around when we are in rooms that we feel like we shouldn't be in. Or in my case, I got a scholarship to play soccer at San Diego State. I was wondering why I was there when I was playing with some of the best <laughs> players in the world. But the reality is that that's the way the world works. Yeah. How much of this is about following things you truly care about, and how much of this is around following people that you truly connect with? Is it both? Is it one or the other? Tell me a little bit about it. I would say it's primarily following things that I fell in love with. I fell mm -hmm. in love with Apple II. I fell in love with computing. I fell in love with Twitter back when Twitter was Twitter, not, you know, Nazis. And, <laughs> and so I have just gone from one love to another. Now, this is where it gets 
a little bit complicated because I think a lot of people are, are they're constantly searching for their passion in life, right? And it starts around 18 when you have to turn in your college essay and, you know, you're being told, well, you got to write about your passion in life. And why haven't you started a foundation or, or built a church or a school in Africa yet? My God, you're 18. You need to get your act together. And so I, one of the spinoff advice I have for people is instead of giving yourself this really high bar of I have to find passion with a capital P, I think you find interests, lowercase i, and interest means you scratch these itches. It may be podcasting, it may be social media, it may be graphics, it may be surfing, it may be you know, photography, who knows? But at the time you start these things, don't, don't say, uh, is this a passion? It's just an itch and you just scratch a lot of itches and some of them will turn out into passions, but you, you won't know that up front. And don't, don't, don't get into a fixed mindset that you need to find your passion young and dedicate yourself to that. You need to do sampling, a lot of sampling. It, it would be like me telling you, you're 18 years old. You haven't gotten married yet. What's wrong with you? You need to do a lot of sampling first. So, so um, I think prescient. And I do believe that we are in an era where let, let's go back a thousand years. You used to see people in your village or your tribe struggling and failing and going on adventures. And you could see the process that we went through in experimenting. And now with social media, the fact that the internet information moves so quickly, you go from never hearing about a person to they're on the cover of the magazine or they have 10 million followers. You're like, okay, apparently this person just everything went from off to on and we don't get to see the journey and this idea that people's um, that they you have to have everything figured out because so many people that we see in the world clearly have it all figured out that 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 puts this unnecessary and i think i would even go so far as to say toxic lens on culture it it sends a message that we shouldn't experiment that we have to know these things and you said something when you were articulating that similar point that there's a gro a growth mindset is required. And, you know, this is a, a key piece of the new book. I want to mention the book is again called think remarkable nine paths to transform your life and make a difference. So is not one of these paths about mindset. Oh, <laughs> the, the book is divided into three paths and it's growth, grit, and grace. So, of, of the 200 people that I interviewed who were remarkable, basically every one of them had a growth mindset. You don't get to be remarkable if you don't have a growth mindset. And the fixed mindset, which is the opposite, means that you know you believe that, that life is predetermined, that you're given what you're given, you can't fix it, you can't change it, you can't improve it. Now, this also works in a rather bizarre way that it can also mean that you believe that you're a gifted musician or you're a gifted math student. And if you have a fixed mindset and you're highly accomplished in one area, the problem is that you're not going to experiment in other areas because you know, you're this violin prodigy. So you're afraid to take up surfing or art because my God, you might not be a prodigy in surfing and art. And so that's going to affect your image and especially your self image. So you stay in your little lane and that is also suboptimal. You need to do a lot of sampling. And um, I, my, one of my recommendations in life is you, you just default to yes. Mm. And a lot of people say, no, you need, you need to pick your battles and you need to focus and you put all your energy into one thing. And my experience in life is just, you just say yes to everything and you figure it out afterwards. And you just, you know, you let, you, you let cream rise to the top, but you're going to milk a lot of cows. That's, I love the, an, the analogy. And to be fair, this is, this is a thing that is not talked about in our culture, right there. It's, it's um, the belief that you have to spend a lot of time in order to be remarkable. 
I subscribe to that. It is true that, you, you know, very rarely does a professional golfer, you know, come out of the womb fully formed. You know, it takes a lot of hacks yeah. at that little white ball in order to be successful. And so this, it seems like where we're out of balance. There's a, an understanding that you have to apply a lot of effort, but this, the, the sampling of a lot of things how can you reconcile these things? Because right now there's someone who's walking on a walking path or sitting in traffic, listening to us talk about this. And there's like, so what is it? Do I want to be a great, you know, golfer, musician, artist, uh, violinist, coder, or do I want to try a lot of things? Can you help us understand that it's, yeah, that, it's I mean, yes. And that, that is an apparent logical conflict, right? How can you try a lot of things and yet be gritty and persevere to which my answer is, that's life, baby. I mean, you know, if it were easy, more people would do it. And I, I think I, I interviewed Angela Duckworth, the mother of grit. Mm -hmm. And she had a really good idea uh, that she uses for her family. And, and it's kind of this idea that everybody in her family, her kids, they have to try something hard. They, they pick it themselves. It's not like mom or dad says, OK, you're going to play tennis. You have to pick it, and it has to be hard. It has to be something that, you know, you don't just fall off a rock, and it's instant. And then the rule is you can only quit after you fulfilled your commitment. So if you say to your parents, oh, I think I really like violin. I can't conceive of somebody saying that, but let's say somebody says, you know, <laughs> I, I really love surfing. And so you, you know, you, 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 book a four week course and one week into it, you say, mom, dad, I like, I don't like surfing. I keep falling off the board. I can't get a ride. All my friends are doing much better than me. I want to quit. Angela Duckworth would say, you cannot quit. You have to fulfill that. And then if you ever get at this point where now you're good and you want to quit, it's okay. You quit at the top, not because you face failure or defeat. You got to quit at the right time too. And what I think is the problem with people who are prodigies and highly talented, which I do not consider myself one, is that, you know, if you if you think you're you know you're six nine and you're just dominating the high school basketball league, and so you're a prodigy and everybody's saying, oh, you know, you're gonna you're the next LeBron James, you're gonna be in the NBA. Well, I think if if you depend on this kind of fixed mindset that I I'm talented, I'm destined, well. Someday in some NBA pre-training, pre-season camp, you're going to see that everybody's 6'9", and everybody's good. And the ones that, that really rise to the top are the ones who are willing to put out the effort. And since you've been treated as this prodigy your whole life, you don't know how to put out effort. And now you hit the wall because you're facing people who are also 6'9", dri dribble with both hands, slam dunk, reverse dunk. You know, 30, 30, 45 footers uh, routinely. And then it comes down to who's going to work harder, not who's the most gifted. And that's when people drop out. You have a phrase, do good shit. Yeah. Say more. <laughs> well, I think that people need to understand that from my perspective and my podcast and my book, it's not a matter of people decide one day, I'm going to be remarkable. Uh, that's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to be remarkable. So <laughs> let me buy this self-help book. And, you know, maybe Guy has a has a weekend conference where for $5,000, I can join people at the Ritz-Carlton, you know, or the Alexis Hotel in Seattle. And, and Guy's going to lecture. And, you know, the opening session is Guy's coming out and he says, look to the person on your left. And, Tell him he's remarkable and look to the person to the right and tell her you're remarkable. And now stand up and shake your hands and we're all remarkable. $5,000 later, you're still not remarkable. So the key here that I think is remarkable people don't make a decision to be remarkable. Remarkable people make a decision to make a difference. Mm. They make the world a better place. And I don't mean you have to be Steve Jobs or Jane Goodall. You can make the world a better place for one person, one family member, one classroom, one team, one pond that you want to clean up. You, it could be one person yourself. 
there are many people in my book who are you know convicted of murder and they became a great artist right they they fixed them remarkable way themselves and so when you make a difference i think one of the natural outcomes is when you make a difference and you make the world a better place people will start believing you are remarkable it's not because you told them you're remarkable it's because you did something good so the key mm-hmm. is do something good everything else will follow and you know, i refuse to believe that jane goodall or steve jobs one day they said you know how can i position myself as a thought leader Ah, uh, maybe I should make a personal computer. Ah, uh, maybe I should make a music device. Maybe I should have a series of stores with genius bars. And then I'll do that. And I'll write white papers and I'll speak at CES. And then people will think I'm remarkable. I guarantee you that never went through Steve Jobs' brain. And you know, because you worked right alongside him and you got to see it <laughs> I, firsthand. I PTSD, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's an interesting segue. The, the, the do good shit is, uh, I fe- I do feel like people, uh, it's so obvious that we skip over that part. And for the, <laughs> the people that we love and admire and celebrate, it's, it's um, they have done good shit and the good shit took them a long time. And it wasn't yeah. good shit for a while. It was not so good shit. And then it got to be mediocre shit. And then it was good. And then they did that for 10 years before everybody else saw that they were doing good shit. And so I would caution us to gloss over that. But there's a part of that, you know, in this picture that I just painted where this takes a long time, I was drawn to this other piece of the book where there is a certain amount of getting other people on board and right. and there is a distinction right you you just articulated that you know jane jane goodall didn't go out and say i'm going to be a thought leader she spent years and years studying primates so that she could help you know unlock some unknown attributes of them that would help us learn more about them and in turn learn more about ourselves and but yet there was something very seductive about what she was doing. You, Steve Jobs, as, as you know, building all of the the products that Steve and the rest of Apple built. That's seductive and interesting. So how much of this is just doing good shit? But there is some aspect of getting other people on board. And I think in the in the book you call it selling your dream. So. Right. Just well, not not dissimilar to that earlier paradox we talked about, where you got to try a bunch of stuff and you have to go deep on some things. How do we, you know, do good shit and 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 not sit back and expect the world to notice it? Where does the role that we play stepping in and letting other people know that we are in the process of building? How do you reconcile those two things? Well, first of all, the phrase is "do good shit," not think about good shit. <laughs> so that's number one. You know, you really got to implement. You have to deliver. There's a lot of people who are thinking about doing good shit. A lot fewer people actually do good shit. Now, I, I listen, I'm a marketing person fundamentally, but I'm kind of a supply side marketing person. And I believe that if you do good shit, the marketing is easy. The evangelizing is easy. And so, I, you know, if... <laughs> Listen, I can't think of a product or service that was really good shit that failed. I think, I think products and services, they have a kind of fate and they realize their fate. So, I mean, I mean, can you think of something the great that died? I mean, I, I can't. Uh, and so I, I would say that if you're thinking, if you're sitting around thinking about, I'm going to do good shit, but the hard part, is going to be getting people to believe in it. I mean, if you're sitting around cogitating like that, I would tell you just stop thinking and just freaking do good shit. And just you just have to trust the system. Um, because, listen, I'm not saying that marketing isn't hard. The hard part of writing a book is the marketing, right? <laughs> that right. doesn't mean you don't write the book. I mean, well, it, if if you sat around thinking of all the things that could go wrong, you will never do anything. And then I guarantee you, you will not be remarkable. Well, what, what part, at what point do we acknowledge that we've made something remarkable or that we're on the path to something remarkable and take that as a sign or 
you know, how ought we think about, yeah, now it is my job to sell this vision to other people. I'll use so many people who are listening and watching right now, the audience, as you know, identify as creators, as entrepreneurs. And there is this longstanding belief that, you know, I would call it a toxic myth that, you know, it is, it's uh, unhealthy for artists to sell their work. And yet <laughs> there's so many people toiling in their parents' basement because they're so, they're too uncomfortable with being able to, to show up and be proud about the work that they are putting out in the world, that they, they are unwilling to be persuasive about the, the work. They don't, if they, even if they do believe in it, there's sort of this a willingness to be, to distance themselves from the work just in yeah. case. How do we know when to begin to, to sell? How do we well, be willing to put our foot in the front door? First of all, I'm not a psychiatrist, <laughs> But with that caveat, uh, let me say that I'll, I'll tell you a story that in the like Mac Stories. Division, this is back in 1983, the person who was mostly responsible for the marketing of Macintosh was a woman named Joanna Hoffman. And in the Steve Jobs movie, she's the character that Kate Winslet paid, played. So Joanna Hoffman, Kate Winslet. And I remember once we were having a discussion, a group discussion of the division. And she was talking about her love and passion for Macintosh. And she said something like, yes, you know, we think Macintosh is so great and it helps people so much and they can be creative and better communicators and more productive. We just want to tell the world. And, and I think that that's a very good test. When you truly have done good shit, you just, you feel compelled to tell the world. It's, it's almost like you feel you have a moral obligation because this is going to help the world. And that's the key to understand between evangelism and sales. So sales is about my quota, my bonus, my stock options, you know, my salary. Evangelism is what's good for you. So when I evangelize Macintosh, really, honestly, I'm telling people you ought to use a Macintosh. It's because I believe it's good for them, not necessarily because it's only good for me. And today, when I tell Canva, tell people to use Canva, I truly do believe it'll make them a better communicator, a better artist, a better, you know, speaker, better social media user. And so, yes, it's good for Guy as chief evangelist if you use Canva, but I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, I believe when I tell you to use Canva, it's good for you too. And that's not true of most sales. Mm. Mm. Is that does that require uh, a certain persona, or is that available to anyone? This idea that yeah, that, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I hesitate to say that it requires a certain persona, because everybody who's like checking up their Myers Briggs right now, they're saying, "Oh shit, I'm not, I'm the INT, I can't do it," <laughs> right? And you know what? I think that causes find you, and so. When you look at people who have created great causes, it's not all Jerry Maguire, Tom Cruise, shuck and jive people. And I would be sure the most successful entrepreneurs are on the spectrum. So, you know, I, I, I don't want people to limit themselves because they think that they are not the right personality to do this. I think when a cause finds you, you will find it. You cannot resist it. So I would make the case that someone who starts Mothers Against Drunk Driving or Mothers Against Greg Abbott, you know, it's not like they said, oh, I'm a real polished speaker, outgoing PR, you know, gregarious kind of type to be a leader. A cause found them and they were so compelled that they didn't think about their limitations and they just went and did it. Mm. It's almost a compulsion, right? Like you said earlier, yeah. it's it's – you can't, you can't see yourself not advocating for the thing that you've been working on or the thing that you believe in. There's a sort of an underlying, I do sense, I, I do experience that with people who have built what I consider to be in your phrase, good shit. There is a belief and it transcends self-belief, right? It, it is a belief that the thing that they have made is actually good for you. Yeah. And, and I do think that that is, that there's an interesting point. And 
I'm wondering if you have a message for someone who might not believe if they have trouble advocating for their work as an artist, let's say, since most of the people listening identify as creative, if they're having trouble advocating for their art, do you believe that it might there might be some deep seed that goes beyond just self-doubt to like that this is actually not good shit? <laughs> well, let me tell I mean, you something. Okay. I think whenever anybody creates anything, there is self-doubt. I have self-doubt about book number 16. I, I bet you've had self-doubt about your podcast or your photographs or everybody sure. has self-doubt. If you don't have self-doubt, then you're Donald Trump or you're delusional. Okay. So that <laughs> both <laughs> not advocating you, you do that. Okay. Everybody. Indeed. I would make the case that uh, a healthy dose of self-doubt will help drive you to do better, to remove that doubt. Right. So if you doubt yourself a lot, well, write a better book, you probably will doubt yourself less. Mm. So I, I think that's the attitude. And like everybody has self-doubt, except people who are delusional and psychopath, psychopathic. So, I mean, don't sweat it. And at some point, you know, that that's also why you need co-founders. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's because you, you need people with complementary skills. So, Steve Wozniak could make an Apple one. Steve Jobs could sell it. Steve Wozniak couldn't sell it himself, and Steve Jobs could not design it himself. So you need two people. I mean, I'm not saying you have to be good at everything. And so part of it is, you know, you fill out your weaknesses with, with people who compliment you. Um, it, this is not – there are people who compliment me in marketing and writing this book. I don't try to do it all myself. I cannot. I'm not good enough to do it. I don't have enough time to do it all. So you, you realize that's, that's kind of a humility too that w one thing I could tell you about Steve Jobs that very few people appreciate is that, you know, when you looked around Steve Jobs' executive staff in the mid-80s, half of his direct reports were women. And this is in the mid-80s. This is way before Me Too was a, a thing. And I could tell you something about Steve that he, yeah, basically, it, it's kind of well documented. He was a tough guy to work for, scary, intimidating, aka he was an asshole. And all of that is true. All of that is true. But you know what? Steve Jobs did not care about your gender, your race, your sexual orientation, the color of your skin, whatever. All he cared about was, are you good or not? That's all that mattered to Steve. He was blind to everything else. And I got to tell you, that's that's a lot better than having to deal with someone where, you know, unless you're a tall, white male from the Ivy League, you cannot succeed in this company. Mm. What do you feel like is a – how ought someone who's thinking about their own career right now – you mentioned collaborators and in the Steve Jobs example that he surrounded himself with people that were – good or or I would argue great to the point to the point you just made and it's early in someone's career and they are having to do a lot of things maybe even things that they're not good at you know is there is this where you invoke sort of this grit perseverance get to a place where you can you've made good enough shit in the areas that you can control that you can bring other people in like I'm curious because there's a lot of people right now that are saying god I, I'm hearing what guy's saying but it's so early in my process. I can't afford to hire somebody else. How do I, you know, what's this balance of, of keep going and I got to delegate these other things or bring on a manager or an agent or some of these other things. Cause when people ask me like, I need an agent. I'm like, are you busy as shit right now? And they're like, no, I don't have any jobs, which is why I need an agent. And I'm like, no agent's going to want to work for you if you don't have a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm, this is a, um, you know, a cart horse sort of argument, help someone out of that predicament. Well, I don't know if it's as simple as listening to a podcast to get out of that predicament, <laughs> right? And, and you know, you, you bring up a very good example. So I've talked to people who say, I've written a book and uh, I need to find an agent to get me published. And I tell them, listen, if you're an agent, 
what you want is you want Michelle Obama to call you up and say, ah, I've written my memoirs. Can you represent me? Or you want LeBron James or Mandela Nelson or you want, you know, Stacey Abrams or you want somebody like that. The agent is looking for someone that he can call up a publisher and say, listen, guys, I'm calling up Penguin, Wiley, Simon & Schuster, Harper's for Michelle Obama's autobiography. We're accepting bids. That person is not trying to say, oh, I just signed Joe Shet the rag man. And he's written Joe Shet the rag man way. And he's published it under the Joe Shet the rag man publishing company. Now, you never heard of him, but he's really enthusiastic and he's hardworking. And, and I say to Joe Shet the rag man, pretend you're walking into a Barnes and Nobles assuming they still exist. So pretend you walk into a Barnes and Nobles and there's 25,000 books in that store. 24,000 are spying out. So you have to turn your head to even read the title, right? 1,000 are on tables face up. Why is someone going to pick up your book called Joe Shet the Ragman, his memoir? And, and I'm, so the agent is looking for Michelle Obama, not Joe Shet the Ragman. And so that's how you have to break out. You, you have to give people a compelling reason. And that reason is, it's, you know, it's going to come down to doing good shit. That's why we want to read about Michelle Obama, not go, Joe Shet the Ragman, who has now built up a seven-digit consulting practice at age 25 because he just quit Goldman Sachs. I mean, <laughs> you know, that book ain't going to do well. I get the point. I get the point. <laughs> but there's and there's a, a a lot of truth to that, and I think this is hard stuff that people don't want to hear. And I deliver that you know a very similar message. And this is sort of that you can't stand out and fit in at the same time, right? You have to. You can't do this shit from the your parents' basement and expect that people are going to. Yeah, you, you have to actually do good shit. You know, to the point that you made earlier about selling when you can evangelize something you're really passionate about, those two things tend to snowball. And that is, you know, making a mark. If you're Joe Shit the Ragman, this is just a great, I'm, I'm never going to forget Joe Shit the Ragman, by the way. <laughs> it's burned into my brain. Damn you. Uh, but it, there is a certain amount of momentum that's required. And this is the feeling that, you know, you get from the book. And this is, yeah, I think it's a reasonable segue to this turn and burn concept. This idea that you're 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 implementing these techniques, and at the same time, there is so much energy, effort, momentum that you're leaving it all on the field. To use sort of the the sports analogy, what ought someone? Like what is what what should we take that to mean? Is this just a is it a burn the boats sort of Tony Robbins mentality? Is no. there some subtlety to it? Like give us a little insight. Oh, there's no subtlety to it. But okay, if let me just backtrack one second so I can give people a metaphor for understanding, you know, how you get people to follow you and what the process is like. So I want all of you to open up your browser and go search for a YouTube video. Use the search term dancing guy in the field. And when you search dancing guy in the field, you will find a YouTube video. It's taken love that at some music festival in upstate New York or something. Yep. And the first scene, and I swear that scene lasts like 60 seconds. It's so good though. It's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy is dancing in the field by himself. And you you look at that and you say, oh, this is awkward. This weird guy is dancing. And so it goes on for about 60 seconds. And finally, a second guy joins him. And he too is awkward. But now there's two people. And then another 60 seconds goes by. And a third person. And then pretty soon, the whole field is dancing, right? Well, that's what it's like. <laughs> I mean, you are the nutcase dancing in the field. When you get Steve Jobs to join you, now there's two nutcases. The third person is the first customer or the first investor. And so it is a matter of you got to achieve critical mass. But until you do, you are a nutcase dancing alone in the field. You just need to understand that. And so that, that's the metaphor. I want everybody that I promise you, I promise you, it's worth searching for that video. <laughs> um, 
Now, going to turn and burn. So turn and burn is this surfing expression. So surfing, I can use a surfing metaphor to explain everything in life. But in surfing, basically, most of the time, you're paddling and you're sitting in the water and you're looking for opportunities. These opportunities are called waves. And these waves come all the time, often separated by 15 to 30 seconds. And at some point, as you know, Wayne Gretzky would say, you know, you don't make 100% of the goals when you don't take the shot. And so this is the same thing with surfing. If you never turn and start paddling, you'll never catch a wave. And this is true about making a difference. At some point, you have to pick an opportunity, turn and start burning, start paddling. And, and this is I think a lot of people, especially in the Western society, we spend so much time, you know, being data wonks and using all big data and making all this perfection and all this AI. You know, we're going to we're going to take all the decisions and we're going to pick the exact right one. And when we pick the right one, then it's easy. And I'm telling you that that's not how it works, that. Instead of focusing so much on making the right decision, which is pretty much impossible because of the lack of data and you just cannot predict the future, right? I mean, if you had written a book about how to do in-person networking in March of 2020 and you tried to publish a book, the way to succeed is to do in-person networking and then the pandemic hits, you know, your book would have not done well. <laughs> so some of that you just cannot control. But anyway, so what I'm trying to say is, you, you've got to just turn and burn. You just have to do it. And I, I'm not guaranteeing you're going to get success. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll use another metaphor besides the guy dancing in the field. There's a Chinese saying that you need to stand by the side of the river a very long time before the Peking duck will fly in your mouth. <laughs> Which is to say... Peking ducks don't fly into your mouth. You got to go hunt the duck, shoot it, kill it, and cook it if you want to have Peking duck. It ain't going to fly into your mouth. And that's what remarkable people have realized. You, you don't stand by the side of the river. Mm. There is a certain amount of effort that's required for greatness, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Guy, thank and you for, again for well, writing this. Thanks. Seriously. When you have found what you love, your interest has turned into a passion. Japanese have a word for this called ikigai. When you have found that, Mark Manson told me, this is a great, great metaphor. He said, guy, you know you're on the right track when what you're doing involves a shit sandwich that everybody else tells you is crazy. And it is, why are you doing this? If you're a writer, why are you spending so much time editing? If you're a podcaster, why are you spending so much time researching your guests and then taking all the filler words out of your podcast? You know, why are you doing all that shit? Christy Yamaguchi, why are you, you going to the rink every morning at 6 a.m., skating for four hours, then homeschooling? Why are you doing that shit? And when you find that you love the shit sandwich, then you know you found your calling. That's the test. That is so good. I'm having a tr trouble deciding what's going to be the cold open because there's so many good. There's so many good. I don't know. Shit sandwich is a pretty good cold open guy. <laughs> thank you so much. Did you say the 16th book? Is that where we're at right now? 16? How wow. many books you got? I, I have 16 books. In <laughs> Chase, God forbid. <laughs> After I wrote the Macintosh way, my first book in like 1987, I said, you know, guy, this is your last book. You have nothing else to say. I, I've said this is my last book 15 times now. No, now 16. This is Think Remarkable is my last book. And, you know, it's it's the book that I want to be remembered for because this book is not about me. This is like the four agreements brought up to date. This is how to make a difference and how to transform your life based on 200 remarkable people and one old Japanese American guy in Silicon Valley who has been there and done that, has seen it all, applying his filter to their experience to get you a 170 page summation of how to make a difference and be remarkable.
two. Well, two. it takes me back to our first in-person meeting. What's that little restaurant in Woodside? <laughs> What's that little restaurant in Woodside, California, that we uh, met at the diner? Bucks. Yes, our first meeting at Bucks more than a decade ago. Two. Um, thank you so much two. for helping me on my journey two. and for now two. inspiring two. a whole new two. generation. Uh, two, again, two, the book title is Think Remarkable. Two, uh, it's two, available everywhere two, books are sold. Two, we'll have you know show two, notes and whatnot. And I can't two, thank you enough, two, Guy, for being dog. a guest on the show. When you do your two. 17th book, after you say you're not going to do any more, you'll always be welcome on the show. Uh, but until then, we will support you and go out and get, get the latest title. Um, and I'm going to do the biography of Chase Jarvis. <laughs> You'll make hundreds. <laughs> I'm always going to do good shit. <laughs> awesome. Signing off from Guy and myself. Uh, he's in Silicon Valley. I'm up here in Seattle. Thank you so much for listening to the show. And until next time, we both bid you a great day. Great day.